the final third of the lecture series, which is on relational aesthetics. And its influence, so some of the practices that have come in its wake. This might seem to follow on smoothly from previous lectures on happenings, social sculpture and constructed situations. As we get into it, you will see there are a lot of uh, similarities. But you should remember that um, there's a 30 year gap between these. So maybe it is kind of the same or similar, but maybe um, maybe it's interesting to note that it ebbed and flowed, or maybe it's particularly different in the 90s for social or technological reasons. So let's start by looking at um, a chronology of events that Claire Bishop sets out in the introduction, I think, to participation. She says that socially engaged or participatory art um, bubbles to the surface at particular times of social struggle. I think a, a slightly better characterization of her quote would be that participatory art comes at times of social struggle. And she identifies three areas or three key historical 20th century um, periods. The first is around the time of the Russian Revolution of 1917. Uh, and you will recall we did speak about that in the first third of this lecture series. Um, I talked about there being revolutionary times there, not just the Russian Revolution of 1917, but the Easter Rising in Ireland. The suffragette movement, um, which was really getting militant before the First World War, and then um, they stopped so that they could support the war effort. But women's uh, suffrage or equality, sexual equality, Irish independence, Russian Revolution, and other things were all uh, going on at that time. And we had what Peter Berger calls the historical avant garde. Dada, surrealism and futurism. We can also characterise that as the birth of communism. So 1917 was literally the birth of communism in Russia and um, the first major country to become communist in the world. Then uh, if we go along the timeline, the second is that Bishop identifies is May 1968. Um, and we've talked about that in the second third of the lecture series, the counterculture movement, hippies, sexual revolution, the contraceptive pill, miniskirts, uh, student uprising in May 1968 in Paris that led uh, to the Renault workers, factory workers joining in a national strike and it looks like communism might spread um, to Western Europe at that point and we could consider that maybe to be like the high point of communism. Or communism's last stand. In other words, from here on, it's going down. Interestingly, there's a split. So although it's a left wing kind of uprising in France in 68 that spreads all over the world, it's an anti authoritarian uh, left wing uprising because in the same year, can you turn your mic off, please? Uh, I can hear people in the back. Um, in, the, in the same year was the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Soviet Union. They sent tanks in to suppress freedom. And that's not what the people in France wanted. They wanted a lot more freedom, sexual freedom. Um, I'm going to find out who you are. Chiara, it's you. Can you turn your microphone off, please? OK, where was I? Um, yeah, so it's, it's conflicted. They don't necessarily want Soviet style communism. Maybe you could say that's 
it, they're showing the cracks in Soviet communism, and that's why it's the beginning of the end or the last stand. But it marks a kind of high watermark in um, communism. Uh, or I suppose you could argue that the Vietnam War does because that becomes communist, but psychologically uh, it's losing a battle perhaps after 68. And then in 1989, Bishop's third period um, is characterized by the fall of the Berlin Wall and the apparent death of communism. So in 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down and um, Germany is reunited, not as a communist country, but as a capitalist country. And uh, by two years later, in 1991, the Soviet Union splits up into different countries like, you know, its constituent parts, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Georgia and more countries. Um, all of whom turn their backs on communism. And this is the third section of the lecture series. We're looking at stuff after 1989. So it fits very much with Bishop's chronology of social upheavals. OK. Part one's an introduction to um, relational aesthetics. The key terms associated with relational aesthetics I'm positing are communication, food and drink, so I'm categorising these, uh, interventions and events, and objects. But what is relational aesthetics, I hear you ask? Well, you're going to need, need to pay attention to this slide because after this you will understand what relational aesthetics is. Uh, the book um, it's based on a book by a French curator called Nicolas Bourriot, uh, which was published in 1998 in French and in English in 2002. But it was already an existing collection of essays that he had published in art magazines, exhibition catalogues and so on. And he put them together into a book published in 98 in French. So um, it's not really a book that kind of clearly goes from beginning to end, but it's a series of different chapters that originally were essays. And it's quite a hard read. Um, so if you, if you read the book, you might not understand what relational aesthetics is first time you read it as clearly as you're going to understand it now, because I'm going to make it super simple for you. Also, I've um, set you a reading um, for the seminar and if you're thinking that wasn't that hard, the excerpts from um, relational aesthetics in Claire Bishop's reader participation. I'm really interested in the translation. So the translation in Bishop's book is different to the translation of the standard book, and it is in easier English. Um, it's not that the original is in incorrect English. It just reads like a French translation. I think it's a bad translation. What you've read is easier to understand, and I wish that that guy who, who did it would translate the whole book. Um, so in any, in any case, though, maybe you're thinking actually it's still quite hard what you read, and it is a bit tricky um, to get your head around. So I'm going to explain it in super simple terms um, for you now. Relational aesthetics, obviously, is a, a term coined by Burio, but it refers to his perception his idea that there is a trend of art making that was in the early 90s, mid, early to mid 90s, that was based on or inspired by human relations and their social context. So what you've got to imagine is uh, we've got in Britain the YBA trends of art, Damien Hirst, you know, putting a shark in a tank, Tracy Emin with her unmade bed, all of that's hitting the news, really kind of um, famous and and across the Atlantic in America you've got stuff like Jeff Koons you might have heard of him uh, Jeff Koons along with Damien Hirst are the two richest uh, living artists and and he makes kind of the you could criticize both the Koons and the 
her stuff has been quite um, easy to get, fun, whimsical, um, and certainly not about or political in any way. You could do. Um, but Burio says there, there are other artists who are making this work based on or inspired by human relations and their social context. And he he puts them together in an exhibition called Traffic, which we're going to look at later, in 1996, and uh, then publishes this book. So he, he's collected some artists. He said, I've noticed that they're all doing common things. I think it's a, like a movement. Uh, not a movement like surrealism and, and all of those that we've been looking at so far in, in the um, first third, where they actually had a membership and a manifesto. So they wrote the manifesto and said, if you want to join, this is what we're about. No. Burio's noticing it after the fact. He's saying there's a trend going on. Uh, and in some cases, these artists don't make work about, based on, inspired by human relations. In at least some cases, human relations are the artwork itself. So that's the medium. It's not a painting of two people having a relationship. It's setting up a situation that encourages um, relationships. Or in Burio's own words, you could say it is um, a set of artistic practices which take as their theoretical and practical point of departure the whole of human relations and their social context rather than an independent and private space. And you have read some about that in for the um, seminar reading, so that might begin to make some sense now. But we can go further to making this clearer by looking at some key features. So um, we're looking at the artist now as a facilitator rather than a maker. They don't make objects, they make situations. Do you remember the situationists constructing situations or make things happen? Art is seen in terms of information exchange between artist and audience. The artist in this sense gives audiences access to power and the means to change the world, apparently, according to the Tate. I made a word cloud. Um, I put I went into the index of the book and I made a note of every artist mentioned in the book, Relational Aesthetics. And I made a note of how many pages they were mentioned on. And then I wrote down a number and I, I put that number into this word cloud. So you can see, uh, for example, Pierre Wieg in most is on most pages in the book and Carsten Holler is mentioned quite a lot so is Douglas Gordon uh, if you don't know those artists make a note of them they're really um, very well known then there are some that are less well known like Pierre Joseph I don't know who he is at all I still don't know and Henry Bond um, I do but he died quite young and um, people maybe don't talk about him so much. Um, what, what can I tell you here? I think Holler is Belgian. Wieg is French, Douglas Gordon Scottish. Um, and then we've got people from other parts of the world. Francia Catalan, quite famous artist, um, recently gave Donald Trump a gold toilet. Uh, he's Italian. Jorge Pardo is Mexican, I think. Angela Bullock is British. Henry Bond, British. Gabriela Roscoe, Mexican. Jeremy Della's in there, just under the H of Wieg. He is British, of course, Turner Prize winner. Andrea Zittel, I can't remember where she's from. Uh, Vanessa Beecroft, English sounding name, but he's Italian, I think. And Gillian Waring is English. So you can see these are all European artists, except for maybe Pardo, who I think or Pazzo and Orozco, who are uh, Mexican. Uh, 
And of those artists, these are the ones that were in the really important exhibition called Traffic in Bordeaux, where um, Burio was one of the curators at the time. So if I go back, actually, the number one name on this list is Riakrit Tiravanit. I know that his name is pronounced that way because I checked it. So if I go back, uh, he's not even on my list in the book. I think he is mentioned in the book, but maybe not, not that often. Uh, he is actually a very international artist. He's Thai. His name is Thai, as in from Thailand. Um, it is pronounced Tiravanit, even though it's written Tiravanija, Riakrit Tiravanit. Um, but he is also Argentinian and American. So he's kind of grown up in different places around the world. We're going to see quite a lot of his work. Also, Philippe Pereno, is he mentioned on this one? No, but he is mentioned in the book. He's a mega famous artist. Um, along with Pierre Wee, I would say they are two of the most influential artists around uh, over the last decade. Carsten Holler, Christine Hill, Vanessa Beecroft, Maurizio Catalan and Jorge Pardo were all in this exhibition. There might have been others as well, actually. So now we're going to get into types of relational art, um, starting with artists that work with communication. The first one we're going to look at is an artist by the name of Lincoln Tobia. Um, two concurrent projects by this artist. Um, in fact, one with one aspiration to open or reopen the discourse about the relationship between visual arts and the public sphere. Lincoln Tobias studies for uh, It All Comes Together in LA 1995 at Pat Hearn Gallery and Mini AM 1995 at Gavin Brown's Enterprise. I think we have a student, don't be called Gavin Brown. Gavin Brown's uh, an influential gallery. Oh. Um, Anyway, in those two exhibitions, Lincoln Tobia set up a gallery based radio station and invited the public to take part in live broadcast discussion. That's why there's no image for this slide, because it was over the airwaves. Communication. Uh, then we have Angus Fairhurst. He also died young, didn't he? Um, Gallery Connections, 1991, is based on recordings of a series of contrived telephone exchanges between unwitting gallery employees. Fairhurst rang two different galleries simultaneously and held the handsets together. He himself does not participate and remains silent while the speakers are initially disoriented. Gradually, you know, they become more hostile as they try and figure out what's going on. The transparent desk in the artwork there exposes the sound equipment that is supposedly hidden inside. Um, so it subverts this sense of surveillance. Also, Douglas Gordon phoned customers in a cafe and sent multiple instructions to um, selected individuals. It sounds like something Steve Fossey would do to me. This. And this is super um, famous. Please don't write about this in your uh, essay. It's been done to death, really. Um, but if you're interested in it, please do read about it if you don't know about it, because it's a good artwork by Gillian. I think it's called Signs That Say What You Want Them To Say and Not Signs That Say What Someone Else Wants You To Say. So she's an English uh, video artist and photographer. She describes her work method as editing life. 
By using photography and video to record the confessions of ordinary people, her work explores the disparities between public and private life, between individual and collective experience. Waring has cited the influence of English fly on the wall documentaries such as Michael Apted's Seven Up. Has anyone seen that? Uh, it's a beautiful programme really. It follows the lives of children aged seven and then every seven years to see how they've developed, what jobs they get, long running series. Or also the 1970s documentary, The Family. You can think of these kind of like um, proto, what came before Big Brother and that reality TV and all of that. So this artwork um, was made shortly after her graduation from Goldsmiths in 1990. And it was produced by approaching people on the streets of London and asking them to write something on a card and then photographing them as they displayed it. Private lives were given a sudden and revealingly painful exposure. A policeman holds a card reading help. With the introduction of video and more in-depth interviewing techniques of her subjects, Waring began to use adult actors, uh, lip syncing the recorded confessions of children and other subjects solicited from uh, advertisements placed in newspapers, making confessions or another, in another work, she had people making confessions whilst wearing masks, a bit like, I don't know if you remember, but there used to be old uh, photo booths that you'd go in and sit and have your photo taken for your passport photo. They still exist. Um, and it's kind of like that, they come in, close the curtain, they have a mask on and they just confess something to the camera. I watched this, I think it might, it might have been in New York um, or it might have been London, but I've been walking a lot. I was really tired and I sat and I just watched the whole thing. It goes on for hours, but it's really captivating and fascinating. The introduction of actors signalled an increasingly dramatic element in her work and a shift away from the use of documentary techniques. For example, by the 1999 video uh, called I Love You, she used actors to explore the theme of strong private emotion spilling out into a public or semi-public domain. The scene of a drunken woman repeatedly screaming I love you is played out a number of times. Uh, the reaction of her three friends differs each time. Gillian Waring won the Turner Prize in 1997, uh, which was an all woman lineup for the first time. Shortlist. So there are others that are, that are categorized along within the relational paradigm that deal with uh, communication or an access to communication and the relations here between people through um, broadcasting, confessing, writing down. There are others, but we will move on to food and drink. Speaking of confessions, I have a confession. I, I don't like eating alone. Seems really sad and lonely. I kind of don't mind it if I'm doing it at my desk, but I don't like to go into a big canteen or something and eat on my own. And when I was a student, I couldn't understand people that would um, in a shared house go and eat in their bedrooms. I kind of think of it as a very social uh, act. I like to cook together with people and eat together with people. This is Georgina Starr's artwork, Dining Alone. From 1993, it's an installation with audio, text and photography. An invitation to make work for a Paris restaurant turned into a lonely and paranoid meal for one for star. At a later date, lone diners at the same restaurant are invited into the wine cellar, where they can dine by candlelight whilst listening to star's thoughts. Um, thoughts about her own lone dining experience. 
While in Paris, she also dines alone on a makeshift table by the Seine River. It's a quiet spot where she can be completely alone, away from the eyes of other diners. Also, Angela Bullock um, had a cafe that triggers Kraftwerk music. Kraftwerk were a German um, arty band. So it, it triggered that when a certain number of customers sit down, tri triggering things. So you have a shared experience. You're all at tables, not talking to one another, and something happens that connects all of you. I said we were going to come back to Rierkrit Tiravanit. We will. Um, he said it's not what you see that's important, but what takes place between people in relational art. He's a kind of key relational artist, although, as I've just shown you, he's actually not one of the most mentioned in the book. This is what he is famous for. For Tiravanit, everyday rituals such as eating meals, cooking, encounters, conversations are keys to understanding different cultures. Remember, he's from at least three different cultures, Thailand, Argentina and America. These rituals are art in his view. Since 1990, he has aligned his art with an ethic of social engagement, inviting viewers into his work. In one of his best known series, uh, begun here with Pad Thai 1990, uh, an untitled Free on Screen 1992, he rejected traditional art objects altogether and instead he served, cooked, he cooked and served food to anyone who came to create a social relation. So he's done it more than once, um, just to make that clear. He, the first one was at Paula Allen's gallery in New York, 1990, but the images I've got here are from uh, a different title, Untitled Free, 1992 also in New York. The idea here is to move from passive viewing, looking at pictures. That's not what we want from your presentations, uh, the rehearsals tomorrow and the final ones. We don't want to hear about passive viewing. We want to hear about more interactive, activated audience participation. The same in the essay. Uh, but the, he, he is, the idea is to move away from what he sees as passive viewing to active participation. With this simple gesture, Tiruvanit supposedly bridged a mind-body gap that often exists in Western art. He was a medicine man who literalised art's primitive functions, sustenance, healing and communication. At galleries and museums around the world, he has prepared meals and fed visitors, broadcast live radio programmes, installed social spaces for instruction and discussion. He has set up apartments where he or visitors might live for the duration of the show. And he has dismantled doors and windows, leaning them against walls. When he makes objects, they are generally modest in nature. Uh, he also, as you can see from the image, has a real penchant for plywood. If you walk into a gallery and there's a big plywood space like that, it might well be a, a Tiravenit. He said um, it's really difficult to get good quality Asian food is the word he uses, because in America that tends to mean what we might call East Asian or Oriental. In Britain, when we say Asian, we mean Indian, really, don't we? But he, he says it's difficult to get good Asian food in America, so he's cooking authentic Thai food for people here. 
and that and food is a great way to kind of bridge a gap into someone else's culture, isn't it? I, I think. Everyone likes food. But was it original? This is Gordon Matta Clark. Do you remember him? Uh, two weeks ago, or no, last week, in the performance art one, I started with the kind of New York love scene um, with Trisha Brown, um, Laurie Anderson, and Gordon Matta Clark. Uh, he does other things. He's actually really famous for cutting houses in half. Honestly, completely, literally cutting houses in half. So they kind of have a gap. Um, quite amazing, big architectural works. But he also did this in 1971 in Soho, New York, along with the dancer Carolyn Gooden and other members of what would later become a collaborative group called An Architecture. Um, this group also included Laurie Anderson and lots of others. Um, they opened a restaurant called Food. The restaurant works as the artists, uh, an artist's cooperative in which somebody different would cook each day in kind of like an anarchist commune, hence the term an architecture. Yet it was not only a business. Here they had performances, meetings were also held there. They turned it into a kind of food theatre. So there's two ways of looking at this. You could say, well, um, Rio Kripta of Anitz is making work that has a historical precedence. Uh, it's not, um, that gives him some sort of justification to do that. Or you could say um, he's not doing anything new really, he's rehashing something from 1971. Remember, Bishop said around 1978, and this is obviously only three years after. He's not the only one um, that does things like this. This is Franz West and Heimo Zobenik's bar. It's, it's, that's the title, bar. I'm putting named artworks and named exhibitions in italics, so you can tell. Um, 1997, they created the Documenta Cafe for Documenta 10. Documenta is one of the most important um, art biennials. Strictly speaking, a biennial means every two years. This one happens every five years, so it's not a biennial, but it's a big kind of um, important event in Germany every five years. And he created the cafe. In 1998, this cafe was um, augmented by a bar, which was shown at the uh, Fundusal de Serralves in Porto, Portugal. The bar turns the gallery into a space where the World Cup 1998 games were screened daily. Carsten Holler made Double Club about a decade later. Uh, this was designed as a cross pollination of Congolese and Western culture, a living, breathing arts work intended to be fun and thought provoking. The bar was split down the middle. On one side, Congolese beer was served from beneath a corrugated iron roof. On the other, champagne was served in a gleaming copper bar. On the walls, on one side is Congolese graffiti, on the other, anti Warhol prints. On one side, there are um, plastic cafe chairs and they serve Congolese catfish cooked in arrowroot leaves. On the other side, they have velvet upholstered banquettes, benches, um, where Western food was served. On one side is Congolese music, the other Western. There is a one way mirror, a sort of, uh, the sort usually featured, you know, in like police interrogation movies where you, you've got the interrogation room going on and the police are looking through the mirror. 
that goes across the main wall so that dancers could look into the bar area without being observed. Holler says, I like to add layers of confusion. I've been very interested in the idea of doubt for a long time, and I've tried to create an environment with that same quality of doubt. This is a place that is neither entirely Western nor entirely Congolese, nor a fusion. It's just two things at the same time. I'd be interested to hear what you think about this kind of brutal separation and characterization of um, the West as rich and Congo as poor. Of course, Congo is poor. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. The next section, part three, interventions and events. Ben Kinmont explains his artwork. It's easier to talk about art while washing dishes. I had gone downstairs to the city public library to ask if I could wash the librarian's dirty dishes. Upstairs in the art centre during the opening, I washed these dishes while people videotaped me, chatted and then signed my body. Archive begun in 1995. Seven people brought their dishes. 18 people videoed me, each signing my body. Projects can be repeated. What do you think of that? Is it a clever way of bringing people together to facilitate conversation? Or is it not art? Is it um, linked to Christian culture? Insofar as um, it reminds us of Jesus washing his disciples feet, an act of humility, the people who are perhaps paid less or the least in our society. That do, um, it's a very unskilled job to do the washing up in pubs and restaurants and those people are paid the least. So by offering to do this, is it an act of humility? We can read lots into this. This could go in communication, I guess, but I've put it in interventions and events. Jens Harning's Turkish Jokes from 1994 produces a micro community of immigrants brought together through laughter. This is achieved on the street but an exhibition could also establish communities. So what he does is he puts up these loudspeakers in Denmark and broadcasts jokes in Turkish. Um, and obviously, if you hear the joke and laugh and you see somebody else who hears the joke and laughs, you have a kind of connection. You realise, oh, they're Turkish too and they've understood the joke. For May Day, um, or Vertish, made on the 1st of May, Philippe Pereno asked his dealers. Elza, I think your microphone's on. Do you mind turning it off? Uh, he asked his art dealer to invite friends and, acquaintance and acquaintances to spend all of May Day working in the gallery. The room contained various tools, uh, projectors, a screen, an ironing board, an iron, pieces of fabric, a sewing machine, a large quantity of T-shirts, electrical materials, two video cameras, two circular tables, and a series of plush teddy bears. The artist asked those present to complete certain tasks, such as stamping the words 
my first secret on the small t-shirts and putting these shirts on the teddy bears or making a gigantic t-shirt in which up to five people could fit uh, and videotaped all of the participants' activities. The activities ceased at the end of the day in a final tour uh, three days later, in a final touch, sorry, three days later, the windows were sealed with black cardboard for the duration of the exhibition. Why did he do that? Well, the first phase of collective labour working in like an assembly line to make these teddy bears consisted of actually constructing the work shown in the gallery. This was followed by what he calls a reception phase during which the public entered the dark room to view the videotape of the activities. The teddy bears uh, placed on tables, the large t-shirt stretched, cut and hung on a clothesline. Because it was designed in this way, Pereno's project also contained elements of the unexpected, which became integral to the artwork. The teddy bears turned out to be um, my first secret teddy bear kind, which are designed to record the voices of children that speak to them. The recording can be accessed by pressing one of the bear's paws. But in this case, the teddy bears played back fragments of conversations and background noise that had been inadvertently taped by the Korean workers who had manufactured them. May Day is the International uh, Workers' Day. So the work is about workers and our relationships to them bringing their conversations from the factory. We don't think necessarily about who makes our products. Or maybe you do, I don't know. Um, we've had people killed in fires in um, clothing factories in Bangladesh because the workers, uh, sorry, the owners lock the doors to stop their workers from stealing garments that they make. And then there's a fire and they die in the blaze. And those are the conditions that allow us to have cheap Primark fashion. Not just Primark, actually, most high street uh, brands. And um, there, there was a spate not that long ago, a few years ago, of suicides in Apple's factories in China. Um, which makes you wonder what the working conditions are like when several people kill themselves. OK. This is also Philippe Pereno, no more re reality. La manifestation, manifestation in French and other Latin kind of languages like Spanish means demonstration, really. A document of an event, a demonstration in a schoolyard in Nice. Yelling and marching with banners around the courtyard of their primary school. The protesters are young, seven or eight years old. They didn't know what a demonstration was before they came together to think about their demands. In the process of agreeing a slogan, they began to imagine another reality. Christmas in September. Snow in the summer. Their slogan became a catchphrase, no more reality. The kids wanted to shout it in English to echo the familiar tagline, just do it by Nike. In another work, Pereno organized a party saying that he wanted to occupy two hours of time rather than the two square meters that he had been allotted. Um, this is Gabriella Roscoe, Cats and Watermelons, says it all really. Uh, an interesting intervention into a supermarket by putting cat food onto melons, something that you could do very easily and would have an effect immediately with publics. These are good examples of artists interacting with publics. And 
another one of his works. This one is called um, Find Another Yellow Shvalba. It's a set of 40 colour photographs. 39 show two bright yellow motorcycles of identical design standing adjacent to each other in various different street scenes. And one which features three motorcycles parked by a wall. That's at the bottom, the last one in this image. The pictures have a fixed sequence, although they have been exhibited in various arrangements. So it could be one long line or a grid or whatever, but they have the same order. They were originally designed for display in a single horizontal line with the photograph that features the three at the end. The scenes in the picture are quite closely cropped with the motorcycles always standing roughly in the centre with a limited amount of the urban environment around them. They are presented broadly in profile, facing to the right in all of the pictures, except for the first three, uh, in which they're shown front on. Except for one photograph in which the blurred form of a cyclist is seen riding by, none of these pictures feature people. Aside from the brightly coloured motorcycles, the pictures are dominated by greys, browns and other muted tones. What the artist does is he has this motorcycle and he rides around uh, the city until he finds another one that's the same. And then he stops and he photographs the two together. So we move on to um, the next section, which is to do with objects which may seem unusual when we're not really talking about um, material practice here, we're talking about human relations. But objects can serve a purpose in generating human relations. This is Pierre Wieg, one year celebration from 2006. He wonders whether in today's society, the act of celebration can continue to be a social event that nurtures relations of exchange and the desire to share. Is there any celebration that has not been hijacked by consumer society? In 2003, we invited architects, artists, musicians, writers and art critics to suggest dates for celebrations that could be shared with the community. And he added these to a calendar. The results from this initiative emerged in 2006 in the shape of this work, which brings together 48 posters forming a calendar of invented celebrations in a range of different fields. Uh, some are political, social, some to do with music or art and so on. Some state reasons for their particular choice in small print below. That's the bits that you can't read there. They will be explained. Um, whereas, so if you look at Animal Intelligence Day, for example, it's got an, uh, an explanation underneath it. Whereas to the left of that, left-handed people celebration doesn't. I guess it says it does what it says on the tin. The proposals for these new celebrations fill the calendar, suggesting the possibility of a permanent state of celebration every day, repeated year after year. Our time is regulated by the calendar, over which we can exercise little control these days. One year celebration invites us to think about how time is managed, how it is imposed, and how impossible it is control personal time. The festive irony implied in this installation invites us to think about what festivities, whether real or invented, we identify with. Powder coated aluminium benches and a sequence of new discussion platforms. A series of structures that continue Liam Gillick's interest 
in the legacy of applied modernism and the tension between functional and aesthetic constructions. For years, Liam Gillick has extended his artistic activities to the construction of discussion places or spaces, raised platforms, circular seating, partitions and structures that offer the body a limited set of options. Structures are not, these structures are not easy um, in that you have to choose to enter or not, but they also open up subversive skeptical possibilities of being there perhaps without taking part or getting distracted. Gillick is probably best known for his multicolored translucent screens and platforms, which supposedly operate as metaphors for places of discussion and negotiation. Gillick sees his work as related to the conceptualist tradition, which presents art as an activity for communication and exchange. So he makes it, the artwork is the bench, not to look at, but supposedly because you can sit on it and have a conversation with someone. The artwork, not in this image, but in other images, might be a platform uh, that you can enter into and speak to someone on. We're going to have more on Gillick and Rear Crypt than it next week. This is Maurizio Catalan Stadium. It's an 11 a side table football game. I've played on that in the Tate. It's quite fun. And um, I've also seen this artwork, I think, in the Hayward Gallery. Or maybe the Tate. Yeah, I think it was the Tate. Gabriel Orozco's Carambole with Pendulum. which consists of a full-size billiard table that's been modified into an oval shape so that it has no corners and no pockets. Based on a French version of billiards called Carambole, Orozco's game includes three balls, two whites, that rest on top of the green felt surface, and a red ball that is suspended just above the table with a fine metal wire attaching it to the ceiling. A stack of cues stands nearby in a wooden case ready for use. If a player hits one of the white balls so that it hits the red, the red ball swings unpredictable, un unpredictably, bringing about an element of chaos to an otherwise ordered and rational game. The functional aspect of the work complies with Orozco's conception of sculpture as a platform for action. It's not just an object, but an object that you are using, he says. It's fun. You laugh, you come together and you have a game with people in a gallery, but you're aware that it's not a proper game. You can't really win it. You can't, it's useless. You can't pot the balls. Although there is a, gate, a version of billiards where you don't pot the balls, you get points for hitting them and bouncing off of cushions and so on. This is also Gabriela Roscoe. And I can't tell you much about this. I've forgotten about it, but it's on the front cover of Burio's book, Relational Aesthetics. Um, there's a hammock in an office in the Museum of Modern Art. And I don't know, I can tell you he's Mexican and hammocks are Mexican. The word hammock comes from a, a Mayan word, I think, and they are very common in Mexico. There are parts of Mexico where people sleep in hammocks. Uh, I used to live in Mexico and I've met people from Tabasco where they, they tend to sleep in hammocks. Back to Philippe Pereno, but in a different category now, we've got objects. He created installations of thousands of helium balloons in the shape of cartoon speech bubbles, and he's done this in more than one exhibition. When I was your age as an undergraduate student, I saw this in um, what used to be called Leeds Metropolitan 
University's Art Gallery. Now it's called Leeds Beckett University. These speech bubbles were originally created for trade union members to write their slogans on during a demonstration. Remember things with the teddy bears, he's interested in labour and workers obviously. Perino has also presented them as a cloud of bubbles covering the ceiling of expansive spaces, empty of words and collected on the ceiling. They suggest perhaps a potential or suspended discourse that may or may not ever occur. Do you know this one? This is super famous, quite a sad story, isn't it? Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA is an allegorical representation of the artist's partner, Ross Laycock, who died of AIDS in 1991. The installation consists of um, 175 pounds of sweets, which corresponds to to the weight or Ross's ideal body weight. Viewers are encouraged to take a piece of candy and the diminishing amount of sweets represents a parallel with Ross's weight loss and suffering prior to his death. Felix Gonzalez Torres, a Cuban American artist, stipulated that the pile should be continuously replenished, thus metaphorically granting perpetual life. But there is another less personal element. The artwork asks questions like, how many sweets should you take? Grab too many and you're confronted not only with your own greed, but also notions of capitalist accumulation. Some gallery go goers are scared to take any. They wait for others to take the lead. And this raises questions about our relationship with authority. Maybe you're the kind of person that wouldn't do it unless you could ask the security guard, am I really allowed to take this? Galleries and museums are often quite regulated spaces, aren't they, with rules. They have a security guard in a uniform that tells you not to stand too close, don't touch things like that. It's, as you enter into the space, you might feel like you could get into trouble because of that. Here's a quotation. Um, when people ask me, who is your public? I say honestly, without skipping a beat, Ross. The public was Ross. The rest of the people just come to the work. Issues of ownership, particularly in the It Sits on the Gallery Floor series, here we've got a giant stack of um, posters. Although not apparent at first, visitors are invited to take copies of an unlimited edition of prints. I've taken one of those, I don't have it anymore, I'm sad to say. A museum goer listening to the audio guide often starts the trend, uh, trying to snatch prints and then a cluster of tentative visitors soon follow suit. Follow suit? Yeah. Uh, when the stack gets below a certain height, the museum guard replenishes the pile with fresh prints, awaiting the next hourly, orally informed print poacher. Carsten Holler said,
this. It's about making an experience work beyond just going to see a sculpture that's in a museum. It's so much more interesting to produce an environment where you can subject yourself to a very personal experience where you can use that experience as raw material rather than simply oil paint or marble. Let's have a look at some Carsten Holler works. Here we have Mirror Carousel. As the title suggests, it's a full scale fairground carousel, but with mirrored surfaces. You sit on a swing and watch the world move around you. Endlessly refracted. It is dizzying, but not because of its gentle circling motion. Because of the. Reflections. Perhaps he's most famous for this test site, um, first shown at the Tate, Tate Modern in 2006. Holler's interest in slides runs from their use as transportation and the effects of sliding itself, which involves a necessary loss of control. You have to let go, don't you? Uh, vertigo and a strong emotional response. He is also interested in the shape of slides as a counterpoint to the rectangular architecture in the turbine hall. So we've kind of got rides and, and so on. Those are the types of relational art that um, that I have categorised relational aesthetics into. Next week, we're going to do a lecture called Relational Antagonism, which is a critical look at some of these artworks, saying maybe that they are uh, not all that 